The five powers are spiritual practice for one meditation session, one day, and at death. They are the power of intention, the power of habituation, the power of white seed, the power of rejecting negative actions, and the power of aspiration. All five powers have alternative translation choices, and so they've been included here in case you're doing further reading and you come across a slight variation in the way the terms are expressed. The point of the five powers is to mix the mind and reinforce the mind's tendency towards altruism, towards wisdom, towards peace and contentment in general, and for the ultimate goal of enlightenment in particular. And the reason why these five are mentioned is because they're incredibly efficient ways to get your mind organized, to plan a session, to plan a day, to plan your time of death, so that you don't feel insecure about what it is you're doing. And what's more, when things are very difficult, they just kick in in the moment of truth. And if you were to orient your life by these five powers, it would move the mind towards the Mahayana path and increase the depth of your Mahayana path just very naturally. So rather than feeling like you have a million different practices to do, you have one practice. Your one practice is the five powers and everything else can be plugged into it. It really helps the mind feel settled and organized and happy to have a very clear framework of what it is you're doing for your life. So these five powers, um, of course, come from the Buddha, but in particular were clarified and popularized by Geshe Chakawa in his Seven Point Mind Training. So they're particularly of the Lojong thought transformation tradition. If you can memorize these five powers, that's of course excellent. If you can understand the order of them in the different contexts, of course that's very excellent. But really the main thing is getting clear on the essence of what's being expressed here. That basically before, during, and after any activity, it's important to ask yourself, what am I doing and why am I doing it? And to invite mindfulness in this way that's proactive. And it's not just a passive mindfulness that says, oh, I'm listening, oh, I'm reading, I'm walking, whatever. It's a bodhicitta mindfulness that has an agenda to stay on your spiritual path, as well as checking to see if there are any interferences to your spiritual path arising within your mind. So instead of passive mindfulness that is watching, which is, of course, very useful for developing concentration, you're wanting to upgrade it and really see if... In fact, your mind is in alignment with your path and making adjustments if it's not. The order of the five powers for one meditation session is where I'll really go into detail about what each of these five powers is indicating. And then when we go into the five powers during one day and at the time of death, it'll be clear enough to just rearrange them for those contexts. So the five powers for one meditation session, the first one that you do is the power of intention, also called motivation or strong determination. And basically in this step, you're asking yourself, why am I doing this session? This self-awareness is important throughout your practice. Don't edit yourself and pretend to have a higher initial motivation than you actually do even though later you will do some adjustments and some upgrades of your motivation. At first, it's really important to encourage your self-awareness to not jump over what your actual motivation is in order to get to what you think your motivation should be. So for example, at first it might be that you realize you're meditating because you've had a stressful day and you want to settle down. Or you're meditating because the other people in your house are expecting you to meditate right now and you don't want them to look down on you. Or maybe you're showing off. Uh, maybe you're doing the meditation session out of a sense of obligation. There's all sorts of reasons why you might initially sit. You might just sit because suddenly you have space open up in the day. And knowing that is an important key because... As we've talked about many times, self-awareness is the key to all transformation. So you just sit with, why am I doing this session? And then 
probably you're going to need a little bit of an upgrade, and that means reviving or establishing newly a reason for yourself that reinforces your path. And so you're setting an intention or you're cultivating a motivation that is, at the very least, free from the eight worldly concerns, or at least managing the eight worldly concerns skillfully. So making sure that you're separated from grasping at pleasure and comfort and aversion to pain and discomfort. Of course, it's perfectly normal to sit down and try and get comfortable. But once you get your posture as good as it's going to get, let it go. Yeah, it's never going to be perfect. And the more agitated the mind is, the more uncomfortable the body's going to be. The more worries and fears and issues and attachments and obsessions you have in your mind, the harder it is to sit down and just focus. So if you can consciously navigate and manage your eight worldly concerns, be aware that they'll come up. It's perfectly natural for them to come up. But in cultivating the motivation, try to consciously separate yourself from those background drives. You're going to want to separate yourself from grasping at gain and aversion to loss. So in this context, that would be clinging to the best case scenario of the session. Wanting it to go as perfectly as the last time you did the session or the best time you did the session. Hoping for some progress. Um, You know, it's really important that we go into our meditation with reasonable expectations. With no expectations, if possible. Then also being free of grasping at praise and aversion to criticism. This sounds strange to make sure to um, be aware of within your motivation. But actually, sometimes we meditate kind of with the idea of who will tell after we've meditated. Yeah, look how good I am. I'm a good spiritual person. I need a pat on the head or whatever. And so just being clear that um, needing validation is not a great reason to meditate. That grasping at good reputation and aversion to bad reputation, you know, needing people to respect you as a practitioner, needing to be seen in a certain way, wanting people to like you, None of these are the reasons why we want to be meditating. And yet they're very common and they can sneak in. And so you're just kind of checking yourself that these might creep in. I'm going to consciously say, and let me evolve. Let me have some self-directed evolution. Let me upgrade myself. Two, reasonable expectations of yourself in your practice. And then altruism and an expansive and long view are the key. So you might use a prayer, a poem, a mantra to help key yourself into the right frame of mind. So the most important thing is to really sit with how can I deepen my initial reasons? How can I expand into a broader view? And how can I make sure that this motivation is a spiritual motivation? Because this is like your launch sequence. And if you don't launch yourself with a clear and strong determination to be of benefit to both yourself and others, then it might be that you don't really have the momentum to see yourself through the whole session. If you just sit down and think, I need a bit of stress relief, plonk, watch the breath, as soon as you're a little bit relieved of stress, or if it's not coming quickly, it's very natural and normal to then just give up. Or to be like, okay, five minutes done, off I go. Now, if you set your motivation to be of benefit to all sentient beings, then you're going to see yourself through the whole session that you've planned. And then at the end of it, you'll probably be relaxed and you'll probably be with less stress. So you'll achieve your temporary aims. But if you can start with your biggest aims, then all of your miscellaneous temporary aims are achieved as a byproduct. But if those small things are your main focus, it's hard to gather the momentum and continuity to reach your end goal. So it's just an interesting premise to sit with. But the power of intention or the power of motivation, strong determination, is probably one of the most important things to get very clear because we need to bring this into every activity and every transition within a day and within a life. Why am I doing this? And how can I upgrade my reason why? Or revive or recalibrate into something deeper, more expansive, more altruistic.
And then in the meditation session, after the power of intention or motivation, we have the power of the white seed, which is also called the seed of virtue or positive actions. So this is once you begin the actual session. You've recalibrated and revived your motivation so that it's really positive. And now you're going to go ahead and do either placement meditation, analytical meditation, sadhana practice, prostrations, offering, anything like that. But of course, before you even sit down, you want to know what is your actual session? What is the seed of virtue or the positive practice that you're actually going to be doing? Sometimes we sit down and think, I'm just going to do some practice. And without a plan, um, you might wind up with a very watered down practice or something that's not as effective as it could be. And so if you're doing placement meditation, you want to think, what am I placing my mind single pointedly on? If I'm being mindful of a meditative object, what is it and how will I keep coming back to it? So it can just be a few seconds, just coming back to what is the structure of this particular practice. So if I'm meditating on the breath, then I'm meditating on the breath specifically where and how. At the nostrils, at the belly, where am I going to focus my attention in on? And then consciously decide, I'll keep coming back to that again and again, with decisiveness, by choice, with intention, on purpose. So then you go ahead and do it. Or you do your analytical meditation on something like patience, and you know you refresh your memory of the stages of the logic of the Lamrim Chenmo in the Perfection of Patience section, remembering all of the reasons why anger is not justified, thinking about the different reasons why suffering can be useful, why people don't exist inherently, etc., etc., so you just do a quick revive and then go straight into your practice, very clear about where it is you're going. Similar with sadhana practice, you decide, I'm going to do the whole sadhana, I'm not going to stop halfway through, etc. So the five powers in meditation session framework can also work for hearing, like when you're in class or studying, as well as contemplation or reflection time for processing what you've heard through debate, discussion, journaling, or simply sitting with the topic and your relationship or response to it once the content is clearer intellectually. So you set your motivation and then you do it with the idea to see it through. This is really important because the more often we give ourselves permission to stop in the middle, the easier it becomes to stop in the middle, and the more kind of disillusioned we get about our practice because it doesn't seem to be going anywhere or taking any power because we're always kind of stopping and starting. So give yourself the opportunity to get the maximum benefit from your practice by actually doing the practice as it's been described. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. These practices are wonderful and effective, and if we see them through to their end, they're going to have the best chance for actually having the result that we want. So the main thing with the power of the white seed is to actually do virtue. It's, of course, very good to motivate. It's very good to, you know, go through the actions, you know, making your water ball offerings, picking beautiful flowers for your garden, but to actually bring dharma to those activities, not just the activities of a spiritual practice, but the actual mentality that is making those activities spiritual. Because of course, then anything can become a spiritual practice if you're bringing the deep motivation to it. So in the meditative session, you want to just make sure that you have a solid plan and that you see it through. Then we have step three in the context of the five powers in one meditation session. And here we have the power of habituation or familiarization. And in every context, we know that the basic premise in Buddhism is that your mind will do whatever it's trained to do, meaning whatever it's habituated to do, whatever it's familiarized with. 
And so this is continuing the practice for the intended time without sinking into lethargy or agitating into excitement or diverting to a different topic than the practice that you chose initially. So this is really important just in terms of creating really positive mental habits that have power and have depth. So you keep coming back to the meditation object, topic, or practice again and again, not getting swept up or discouraged by your distractions. So of course in your session you're going to have distractions, of course you're going to kind of get intrigued by a random thought that you have and think, oh, oh, I should meditate on that now, now that I have inspiration for it, I'll switch, because I should go where there's energy, right? This is a really normal thing for us to think. But actually, what we want to do is train ourselves in the discipline of seeing our practice through, just as we intended. Um, of course, you know, life is chaotic and full of distractions and full of obstacles, so sometimes that's easier said than done. But if your basic premise is, I'm going to do what I plan to do, you're going to get the result that is described. Whereas if you start meditating on, you know, something like green Tara, and you love green Tara, and you're meditating on green Tara, and then you remember, oh, there's that person that I love in the hospital, I should switch to medicine Buddha, okay, okay, I'm doing medicine Buddha, and halfway th through you switch gears, then you're sort of not getting the benefit of Tara or medicine Buddha, and you're forgetting that... In a way, they're one and the same, but conventionally, the different aspects with different emphases really give a different kind of clarity and direction to the practice. And so you're diluting the intention of the practice by jumping around. Even though they're all wonderful, perfect practices, if you're hopping from one to another, kind of loose associating your meditation, it's just not going to be very useful. So in general, with your daily practice, it's best to do the same practice again and again um, in order to build depth and experience. However, it's okay to zero in on a specific portion of the practice and give it special emphasis in one session before continuing the rest of the session, and then the next time to zero in on a different part. So for example, if you meditate on the eight verses of thought transformation every day, you could give extra time to one verse and then abbreviate the other verses, just read through them without as much time. And it could be that, say, you're really focusing on verse two and you recite the other ones and connect with the other ones, but verse two you give five minutes or ten minutes to. And you do that every day for months and you read commentaries about verse two in between session times and that's just kind of where you're zeroing in on and really giving emphasis to, then that verse really has more life for you. And then you can switch to the next verse and do similarly. So it's not like you have to do the exact same thing again and again, but if you have the exact same framework, then you can be flexible within that framework and give depth to different components and build experience with different components. So it's a different thing than just jumping around, jumping around. Um, of course, it's okay if you want to like rotate Lam Rim prayers, you know, and you want to do a different one every single day, but your framework is, I start with Lam Rim. So you don't have to use the same Lam Rim prayer every day, but the concept is Lam Rim. So it's just really making sure that you're not jumping from thing to thing, making your practice just another form of entertainment and you move on from something when you're bored. It's important to really ask yourself, what is the essence of this practice? And am I giving it a chance to actually do what it's meant to do before moving on? And then in the context of the meditation session, you have step four, which is rejecting negative actions or the power of remorse, regret, reproach. And this basically means rejecting negative behaviors that don't support the goal of the session. So remembering that your attitude toward the practice can be as important as the practice itself. So if you're viewing your practice as a way to show off or as a chore or obligation, 
that minimizes the positive impact of the practice and creates negative habits. Even if the practice is not specifically about purification, even if you're not doing, say, Vajrasattva, it's good to add a brief purification towards the end of the practice, and many sadhanas have this built in. So it could just be a really quick, you know, at the end of your session you think, did I get off track? Did I stumble? Did I add? Did I subtract? And just, you know, maybe three Vajrasattva mantras and just clear any obstacles you might have created by doing your practice in a way that wasn't skillful. Um, and so when you're doing the power of rejecting negative actions, you don't want to sink into a spiral of I'm a bad practitioner, I'm a bad meditator. What you're asking yourself is, when did I indulge afflictions? Did I indulge afflictions? So it could be that during your practice you got distracted, noticed that, came back to your practice. Then no worries, you got distracted, it's only human. The problem is, is if you got distracted, noticed that you were distracted, and allowed it. And went off on a whole tangent, or a whole obsession, or a whole rage spiral, or just daydreamed for 10-20 minutes, and knew that's what you were doing, and just let it. That's something that we really want to work on, not indulging these things, particularly during the meditation session, because the more we can train ourselves in catching the mind and bringing it back to mindfulness on our cushion, the easier it'll be in our daily life. So this power of rejecting negative actions in the meditation session, this isn't just about a purification practice, this is about any meditation session where you're really checking what is your attitude toward the practice? What are the choices and decisions you're making about how much to focus, the way in which to touch the idea? Are there parts that you always like to skip over? Knowing that, examining that, yeah, and making this really something that can enrich your self-awareness, which then can help you train your mind in a skillful way. So whenever you're doing something like this, you want to make sure that you're able to see that there's a difference between your clear and knowing mind, its Buddha potential, etc., and the fact that there are habits that are not useful. Yeah, there's a difference between those two. And so in identifying your negative actions, please don't identify with them. Yeah, don't think of them as you. They're just habits that arose because they made sense at the time and now they got repeated and repeated and they come up as if spontaneously. Catch them, address them, try to change, but don't think that you're bad because of them. And then we have step five, the power of aspiration or the power of prayer. And this is related to what we normally call dedication. So at the end of your meditation session, you dedicate the mental energy or the merit of the session to your highest goal. So for Mahayanists, it's enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. For followers of the Pali tradition, Theravadan practitioners, it's the achievement of the four jhanas and nirvana. And then for non-Buddhists, you can think something like, May this inner work have a positive and lasting benefit to both oneself and others. So, you know, frame this into words that works for you. You can, you know, think of any kind of prayer or any kind of poem or mantra or various recitations that make your mind go into, may this energy be directed somewhere. May it not just end with me on this cushion at this time. May it have a link so dedications act to send the merit created to be a continuous benefit all the way to your goal. So as I described before, if you motivate with the idea, may I have stress relief, then the energy ends when you have stress relief or you feel like stress relief isn't possible or whatever. It's all kind of uh, short-sighted and temporary. If you motivate for enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings, you'll wind up with some stress relief and, you know, positive ripenings all the way to your goal. So we want to send the energy created. 
We want to think mentally, may it reinforce the bridge between one session and another, as well as to create momentum and continuity. And so on your cushion, before you get up, really sit with what was the point of all this? What do I want it to lead to? What am I going to carry with me as I stand up? So sometimes we can get so used to the patterns that we do on our cushion and then what's going to happen next that we forget to make the connection between the two. So you might have had this beautiful meditation session full of loving kindness and compassion. You stand up, go outside, check the mailbox, and see that someone is parked in your parking spot and get immediately grumpy. You know, that's a sign that you haven't pulled your practice into the next chapter of the day. So having a really strong power of aspiration or power of prayer, dedicating in a really focused way, not just rattling off a dedication prayer because you're supposed to, but really connecting with it, means that you pull what you've touched from your cushion into the rest of your day, the rest of your life. And then when you see that someone's parked in your parking spot, you go, yep, <laughs> and you're not flustered by it. And you can take action that is skillful and assertive as opposed to reactive and angry. When we're doing dedications, um, whatever de dedication that you do, whether it's a Mahayanist, a Pali tradition, or a non-Buddhist type of aspirational prayer, it's good to always end it with remembering the fact that everything is empty of inherent existence because it dependently arises. You're remembering the emptiness of the agent, yourself, the action, the meditation, and the object, whatever karma that was created, or et cetera, et cetera. And you really want to think that my practice itself does not exist alone independently. So that can release any ideas of it needing to function or result in a certain way in any kind of immediate sense. It also can help you from over-identifying as a spiritual person and becoming unbearable to live with. Um, you know, really remembering emptiness will eliminate the possibility for fundamentalist thinking. And it's so important because it also protects your merit from being destroyed by negative states of mind, like anger, or from being destroyed by cultivating wrong views. So we really want to protect the good work that we've done. We want to, you know, have a storehouse of merit so that we can have a spiritual practice that goes from happiness to happiness to happiness to full enlightenment. That we have a practice that has resources and support. That we have a liking for practice and a draw to practice. Even if we don't remember what practices we did in the last life, if we have this sense of liking to do it, that's a very important thing to cultivate. So remembering that these five powers are spiritual practice for not just one meditation session, but also for one day and at death. And so just coming back to the five of them are the power of intention, the power of habituation, the power of the white seed, the power of rejecting negative actions or repudiation, remorse, regret, reproach, and the power of aspiration. So the five powers within one day, of course, during the day, you're going to have meditation sessions that also have the five powers. But the really important one to remember is when you wake up and at the end of the day, as well as throughout the day, whatever sessions happen. So when you wake up, you set your strong determination through the power of intention, motivation for the day, life, etc., so as soon as you wake up, you could think, you know, oh, Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, and Gurus, you know, from this moment until my death, may I practice the mind of enlightenment, something like that. You could think the purpose of my life is to free all sentient beings from suffering and to bring them perfect happiness. In order to do that, I need to become a Buddha. Therefore, blah, 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 my day. You know, it can be the refuge prayer. It could be Om Mani Peme Hum. Really anything that is going to reset 
and reconnect and revive your mind to be as altruistic, deep, and vast as it can be. This can be still on your bed. This can be all cozy in your blankets. This could be as you're brushing your teeth or something that you do in the shower. But really at the very beginning of your day, reinforcing and reviving what is the purpose and meaning I've decided I want my life to have. Then throughout the day, you use the power of habituation and apply yourself to the power of positive actions, the white seed, by rejecting negative actions and actively cultivating bodhicitta, by recalling many times in many ways all day long. This is bodhicitta mindfulness practice. And so whether it's some app that you choose to put on your phone that pings at you and reminds you, oh yeah, bodhicitta, or whether it's simple actions that you do throughout the day that you've chosen to be your mindfulness bell, like putting on your shoes, taking off your shoes, like going to the bathroom, like pushing up your glasses, simple activities that you're doing anyway to kind of bring you back to your practice because of course you can get distracted with logistics and forget that the background or overriding holding importance in your day is may I be of benefit to all sentient beings. So it's just really making sure that an ordinary day can still be a spiritual practice and very ordinary activities can take on a spiritual component if you let them if you invite that, if you choose to do so. And then at the end of the day, the power of rejecting negative actions in the framework of a purification practice, and the power of aspiration to do the same practice tomorrow and ever after, as well as the power of aspiration to continue positive actions and do better at the habitual negative ones. So very strong dedications before sleep. And so, of course, you know, on your cushion at the end of your Vajrasattva practice with the four opponent powers is a good time to do this. But if you can do a little mini version of it right as your head hits the pillow, that can be really powerful for having strong bodhicitta dreams, practice dreams, dreams where you're virtuous, dreams where you're not, you know, suddenly becoming a serial killer or some sort of orgy maniac or whatever kind of nonsense is in your mind. If you set a clear intention as you fall asleep, you'll wind up having a virtuous sleep. And then it's not like you waste all those hours of sleep. They actually can be also creating merit and also moving your mind towards enlightenment. So waking up throughout the day and at the end of the day, consciously using the five powers. And so if you've been using the five powers as your spiritual practice throughout your day and within one meditation session, it's going to be very easy to key back into them at death. And at death is when they're particularly vital because, as has been discussed many times, your mental state at the time of death is one of the most powerful conditions for ripening a past positive karmic seed for a positive future rebirth where you can continue your spiritual path. And that's what we want. We want life after life, a continuity of being able to connect to our spiritual path. In our next life, whether it's in Amitabha's pure land, whether it's a perfect human rebirth, hopefully nothing else besides a pure land or a perfect human rebirth, but whatever the case may be, we want a tendency of virtue. We want a liking for spiritual practice. We want to keep the continuity that we've created. And so at the time of death, if we have a very clear and peaceful mind and we think, whatever comes next, may I be of benefit to all sentient beings, it's going to make sure that a positive seed is the seed that's ripened to project your next rebirth. And so remembering that at the time of death, if you can connect with one, your spiritual refuge, two, altruistic intention of bodhicitta, and three, recalling the fact that in your lifetime you have created the cause for another perfect human rebirth or rebirth in a pure land because you have practiced generosity and you have practiced ethics. So feel reassured that in your life, you know, imperfectly as it might have been, 
you did do these practices that create the cause for a human life, a perfect human life, and you've created the cause for a rebirth in a pure land. And so what we want to do is remember the bridge and to reinforce the bridge between the positive karmic seeds of the past and the positive rebirth we want in the future by remembering those stainless aspirational prayers, the power of aspiration, where we thought, may I have a perfect human rebirth? Or may I be reborn in, say, Amitabha's pure land? Or whatever my next rebirth is, may I continue to be of benefit to all sentient beings. May I continue to progress along the path of transformation and evolution. May I continue my work to be of benefit to all. Something like that, right? So remembering that at the time of death, if at the very least you can die with a peaceful mind, then the positive habituations of that mind can kick in. If you're having a clear death, then you can do some specific spiritual practices. But if you don't, just keeping the mind peaceful, keeping the mind positive. So in terms of the five powers at the time of death, near and at death, you're using the powers of habituation and rejecting negative actions. So this means a review of the negative actions done in your lifetime. Recognizing those faults to be faults, keeping responsibility without attributing fault. So let go of guilt. Mistakes are not you. They dependently arose. And they happened. They were negative. You don't want to keep doing them. You want to purify them so that they can't bear the fruit of suffering or negative rebirths. So also you might want to ask forgiveness of those you've wronged. Um, you can do it in person or through a letter or a voice memo or even a visualization if the person is away or is holding a grudge or is already dead. But asking for forgiveness is something that can really help you let go of emotional baggage that might really bring a lot of distress to your mind at the time of death. And it can really leave behind a legacy of peace in the people that you've hurt. It might be that they've already forgiven you, but you haven't kind of formalized it. Um, really just have a think about, do I need to do any repair work? Because these are things that pop up for people at the time of death. And then prayers or other practices to help you let go and feel soothed and at peace. So if you like the Bardo prayers, if you like the Tibetan Book of the Dead, if you like Lama Chopa Guru Puja, if you like Medicine Buddha practice, you need to tell the people who are going to be around you when you die, this is what I'd like to be recited around me, or this is what I'd like a recording of, or these are the books I'd like in front of me. And then also to know that sometimes things can't be organized, that life is chaotic and unpredictable, and so what are just some key practices that you don't need to read, that you have memorized, even if it's Om Mani Pe Me Hum, and you just Om Mani Pe Me Hum, Om Mani Pe Me Hum, Om Mani Pe Me Hum, all the way to death. But in the background of your mind, you have an association with Om Mani Pe Me Hum, that the way to become enlightened is to integrate wisdom and compassion. I want to do this. You know, you know that's the general meaning of the mantra, so then saying it, it's implicit that that's your intention. So then also near to and at death, using the power of habituation and the power of the white seed to review the positive actions done in your lifetime and to see how beneficial they were. So rejoice in them with conviction. You know, you were kind to this and that family member. You were kind to this and that coworker. You helped build this and create that, or you helped uh, dissolve this destructive thing or reconcile this destructive thing. Um, you were a good citizen. You were kind to your kids. Whatever it was, try to really consciously rejoice because one, it makes your mind happy, and two, it maximizes the merit that you've already created. So this is something also in particular to think of walking other people through who are going through the dying process. To take them through those intentional walks down memory lane that reminds them good was done. Your life had meaning. Your life was worthwhile. It had purpose. And so then at death, you use the power of intention and linked with the powers of habituation and aspiration 
you recall your previous intentions and your previous aspirational prayers, for example, to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings, and you revive them once again with the thought, may all the positive actions done in the life ripen as future rebirth most conducive to continuing the spiritual path. So you're just reviving and reinvigorating that bridge between one life and another by really reinforcing those aspirational prayers and intentions. You know, if it's as simple as for all sentient beings, for all sentient beings, for all sentient beings. Or it's linking back to that rejoicing practice, which is, you know, you did this and that spiritual practice or this and that spiritual action or act of service, and I want to do it again and again all the way to enlightenment. So at actual death, if you have the mental space to review and regret and purify, that's excellent. And then stop having regret. Yeah, once you've had regret, stop having regret and shift to rejoicing and reinforce rejoicing and reinforce rejoicing and really feel like this mind has infinite potential and capacity This mind can become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. And next is the eight stages at the time of death, which we have some familiarity with. And we know the clear light mind of death is coming. And this beautiful chance to be with the mind in its kind of natural non-duality. And to, to actually for once recognize that there is no inherently existent subject or object. There is no inherently existent mind. There is no inherently existent self. And bringing that knowledge to the clear light mind of death, we might actually realize emptiness perceptually at that time. And even if we don't, it's going to reinforce the habit of moving the mind in that direction. So we remember that we launch ourselves with strong aspiration. We connect with refuge. We connect with bodhicitta. And then just let your mind abide in peace. And then that consciousness is launched into the bardo with really excellent aspirations, with really positive aspirations. And then it sees all the appearances in the intermediate state as dreamlike, illusory, as the mind's own projection, and is not afraid or distracted by them or attracted to things that aren't useful that the mind kind of carries that powerful intention to be of benefit to all sentient beings. And through the power of those aspirations and positive karmic seeds, the mind enters into a rebirth that is conducive for your path. So try to feel some confidence that you actually can do this. You've already created so many positive causes for positive rebirths. And all that you need to do is water the right seeds. And it's actually not hard to water the right seeds if you keep your mind focused with altruism. And so we'll finish by doing that kind of aspiration that would be really useful at the end of a meditation session, at the end of a day, and at death. So we'll do the prayer of Shantideva from Guide to a Bodhisattva's Way of Life. Shantideva's dedication. May all beings everywhere, plagued by sufferings of body and mind, obtain an ocean of happiness and joy by virtue of my merits. May no living creature suffer, commit evil, or ever fall ill. May no one be afraid or belittled with a mind weighed down by depression. May the blind see forms and the deaf hear sounds. May those whose bodies are worn with toil be restored on finding repose. May the naked find clothing, the hungry find food. May the thirsty find water and delicious drinks. May the poor find wealth, those weak with sorrow find joy. May the forlorn find hope, constant happiness and prosperity. May there be timely rains and bountiful harvests. May all medicines be effective and wholesome prayers bear fruit. May all who are sick and ill quickly be freed from their ailments. Whatever diseases there are in the world, may they never occur again. May the frightened cease to be afraid, and those bound be freed. May the powerless find power, and may people think of benefiting each other. 
For as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain to dispel the miseries of the world.